Hey, here we go. The break is over and I'm kicking off my fifth year of this podcast, which is hard to believe. Uh, to mix things up, I'm also doing the show with video now on YouTube. Here's the first episode in the expanded format with a friend of mine who's a special guest and industry legend. Alex Seropian is an entrepreneur and video game developer who has been creating video games for more than 30 years. He's currently the founder and CEO of Look North World, a developer of games and entertainment for creator communities. Alex started in the video game industry by founding Bungie. Yes, that Bungie. Uh, Halo, Marathon, Myth, big games like that. He's also the founder of Wide Load Games, where we work together, and Industrial Toys. Alex has held executive positions at Microsoft, Disney, and Electronic Arts. Along with starting companies, He's also the host of the Fourth Curtain podcast, highly recommended, a mentor and advisor to numerous startups, and serves as a board advisor to the Tumo Center in Armenia. I think you're really going to enjoy this. But real quick first, a shout out to David Fox, who's one of my Patreon members that I'm coaching as he prepares for a career in the game industry. If you're interested in personalized career coaching, check out the Game Dev Advice Patreon page. There's a Gain Wisdom membership where I do one-on-one -on -one monthly coaching sessions and help people out with career questions, resumes, job ideas, you name it. So that's a resource, a Patreon, Game Dev Advice. But let's go and talk with Alex. Hey, Alex. So what part of the world are you calling in from today? I am in cloudy Southern California, which is an <laughs> unusual place to be because it's usually quite sunny here. But uh, yeah. That is I'm right outside of LA in okay. um, in Southern California. Yeah, you've been out there for a while, right? At least a decade or so. Since 2009. Wow. But you were out but there. you know, I still have Chicago blood coursing through my veins. We'll be bit back in Chi Town in a few days for a little. Oh, bit. yeah, for the holidays. That's how, that, that's yeah. that's great. Um. So yeah, tell me, uh, what's your current role right now? Let's see. I'm doing many things. It, I was reflecting on this recently that I'm actually working very hard, which I shouldn't sound surprised. That's a good thing. It's better than not working hard, I guess. Um, yeah. But uh, I, I am hosting a podcast. So I'm yes. going to plug the fourth curtain. Yep. Uh, just Everyone listen to it. First season, and mm -hmm. uh, we'll be launching the second season uh, after the new year. And uh, I cool. have a new studio which got started in June called Look North World, and we build games on UGC platforms. So we're, right. we have uh, our third island on UEFN just came out. It's called mm -hmm. Control. You know, it's spelled all fancy style, no vowels. <laughs> but like the control key on your keyboard, you know, yeah, no vowels. Right. And it's a, it's a little bit of a love letter to Counter-Strike, Counter but built inside uh, of Fortnite, you know? Who yeah. would have thought you'd ever hear a sentence like that, you know? <laughs> Right, ten years Crazy. ago, I'd be like, "What are you smoking?" What, what do you, I know. What it's like, you what? Mean? you got your chocolate and my peanut butter? How? Huh? Yeah. What? How? Do, how does this work? Um, yeah. No, and, and everyone, the, the the fourth curtain, fantastic podcast. I've listened to a couple of them with uh, Jeff Sway and Matt Booty, and I got more to dig through. You've had some amazing guests on there, and I've been telling folks about it too. So, so check it out for sure. Right on. Um, right on. Thank you. Yeah, and that's exciting too about the new studio and, and building on top of that engine and stripping away a, a lot of those tedious technical things from back in the days when we didn't even have game engines, right? And you had to yeah. write well, you know, it's for different been a video very, cards. Exactly. It's been a very disruptive year, 2023. Uh, you know, I yeah. think a lot of the a lot of the headlines, if you, you know, if you pay attention to the game industry and you look on wherever you're getting your stuff, you know, it's like it doesn't yeah. it seems like there's not a week that goes by where there isn't something that mm -hmm. makes you sad. You know, like yeah. oh, the layoffs, layoffs and, or a project yeah. cancel, or, or this game mm -hmm. is 90 plus rated, but it's not making money. But I've gotten very excited about what's happening with UGC. It, it feels to me like it's a moment. We're having a moment and it's going to be a big, a growing big part of this industry over the years to come. Um, and yeah. that's the thing that about games that is always gives me energy is that there's always something new happening. You know, there's yeah, always something exactly. new. Despite, right. you know, if there's, you know, we've, been through the death of PC, didn't die, you know? Right. The console yeah. game crashed. Well, it came back. You know, it's like people yep. need to be entertained with the work that we do is super important for uh for the people that play games and just mm -hmm. for 
it even you're you're wearing a level X shirt, you know, yeah, for for health, you know, you're right? And uh, I'm super optimistic. No, no, that's cool. And yeah, I remember walking around GDC and they were they were showing the tools, you know, for using the Fortnite engine and all that to develop stuff. And I just remember kind of stopping and looking like, wow, it's its own thing now, right? You know, and and thinking this, how is that going to evolve? And now you have studios being built on, you know, the engine. So that's exciting, right? And that's, I think it's one of the things that attracts people to the industry. It's never the same old, same old. Um, so yeah, I got to keep learning. So thinking way back, like, uh, how did you get started in the game industry? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, you know, my, my, I think my first exposure, at least with what I remember as my first introduction to video games was the Atari, mm -hmm. Atari 2600. Yep. And, you know, my dad brought home, you know, I don't think we were asking for it, you know, it wasn't, I don't <laughs> think it was like, and it, you know, it's not, it's not like we didn't want it, but it, I, I think my right. dad just decided this was a thing he was going to bring home. Oh, this is cool. Yeah. My dad was very much into tech. He didn't work in tech, but he was into technology. And so we got an Atari 2600. And actually, we didn't get the Atari one. We got the Sears Telegames, which was right. it, it yep. was a 2600, but it was it was the co-branded version that right. they, they had done with Sears. Mm -hmm. And um, man, I played so much Atari. Uh, myself, uh, my right. brother, friends of school. You know, we had Apple twos in our middle school. We had Commodore Pets in grade school. I got okay. exposure to computers a little bit there. But that's how I got playing games. Uh, right. And when I got to high school, I started teaching myself how to program because I thought, well, maybe I could make games. Mm -hmm. And, you know, had some fits and starts and, and, and then went to college and kind of picked it back up in college. Yeah, when I was getting out of college, thinking about what am I going to do right. <laughs> my yeah. life? I've always been a maker, you know. I've always, yeah. I've always wanted to make things, you know. Yeah, and so I just started making a game my senior year of college, thinking I could start a business around it, and that business uh, became Bungie, and that's how I got started. Right, and, and then you, did, you know, there was Marathon, which was on on Apple, right, and then Myth and Myth Two and stuff like that. Um, yeah, we we had. Um, you know, I I tell my kids a story. You know, we had before Marathon came out, there were three games that we did, and you hmm. know, the first one and the second one were by no means hits at all. They were th basically just in that spot where you were tempted to try again, but you were also tempted to give up. You know, it's like, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> what do we do with this? This is not telling me that I'm a failure. This is not telling me that I'm a success. What do I do? And right. either from naivete or persistence, mm -hmm. let's call it persistence. Um, yeah, yeah. Just kept trying. <laughs> right. So and and that's kind of foundational advice I give people. It's like, it, you know, it's very rare that you get success very quickly. It comes from persistence and hard work. So be persistent if you yeah. really want it. And I think we first sort of crossed paths. There was a presentation for Myth or Myth 2 at the Herald washington library in chicago and i was at blue bite at the wow. time yeah and i remember you guys presenting and it, it might have been right at the cusp and when, when 3d cards were coming out you know and, mm -hmm. and just i remember showing you were demoing about spinning around the character and looking at it from different angles and it was just like whoa this whole world is opening and yeah i think alan turner might have been there and, and a few folks so yeah, and and then of course you know Bungie goes on to Halo and all those kind of amazing things. Back when people said you can't play a first person shooter with a con game controller, that's just that's blasphemy, <laughs> right? Like it was just like I remember people just we getting so mad first, about the idea. You know, I, right? I I think you know we, we did a good job. You know the the, the implement controller implementation for Halo was, was pretty good, but weren't the first. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. GoldenEye, GoldenEye right, was, Golden Eye. Yeah, yeah. was uh, yeah. very successful, uh, mm -hmm. paving the way. So they, there was there there was an idea that it could work, but yeah, yeah it was there was a lot of skeptics. We were right. all a little skeptical. You know, it's like, wait, we're going to do what? What? <laughs> <laughs> Let's see what happens here. Okay, so kind of thinking back, like, what do you wish you had known when you started on this journey? Right, you're talking about persistence. Is there any other kind of things that you, you could tell your your former self, a young person getting in? Uh, well, you know, it's interesting. It, there's so many lessons that I've learned along the way. I've I've had to learn the hard way um, mm -hmm. because our industry is is young. I uh, I've put this in presentations before. If you if you look at various professions that uh, 
you know, you go to career day, you, know, you talk to high school kids and, you, and there's so many things that they can think about doing, you know, professionally. Many of those mm-hmm. careers have been around for a long time. And some of them are new. Some of them haven't even been invented yet. But video games are pretty game developer is a young career, you know. So there mm-hmm. weren't a lot of, you couldn't go to school to learn how to yeah. do stuff. Um, so th- mm-hmm. there's, there's lots of things that I would tell myself to steer wide <laughs> or, <laughs> or don't you know, or do or don't do, um, et cetera. The thing that I found the most challenging along the way don't really mm-hmm. fit in that category. They, they more okay. fit in the category of how how do you manage people or you know, manage oh. groups or relate to, like, solve problems that involve people, like solving a, an mm-hmm. engineering challenge or trying to figure out a business strategy. In a lot of ways, you know, comes down to, to the logic and the hard work. But like, Let's yeah. say you're developing a project on a team with a bunch of people and there's a lot of talent in the room, but maybe not everybody gets along. Yeah. Um, and how do you create an environment where you can solve that problem? Or you know, maybe mm-hmm. maybe it's not solvable. How do you know? Yeah. Like, yeah. And I was just a kid to get out of college and started a company and it grew. And I did go yeah. to business school. I didn't get any training. I don't have a psychology degree. Um, <laughs> yeah, I would exactly. go back. If I were to go back and talk to me young, I would say, look, you're going to run into this situation where you've got, you know, a tyrant or a project lead that nobody, they don't put that person in charge or, you know, mm. you're going to have this happen. And this is the kind of problem that's solvable. And here's some strategies for trying to solve it. These kinds of problems, these are really hard to solve. So don't get yourself in that situation. And it's all, for me, it would all be about, you know, team building and, and the, the, the people part. Um, right. So, yeah. Right. And then to throw complexity on top of that, you know, you get used to working on teams in person and then, you know, everyone goes remote, right? So then you have to like figure out how to do that. And yeah, how do you I'm sure those I'm gaps, sure you know? 10 year future me could come back and tell me what to do now. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Maybe Let's get this software. Hey, do 10 this. year future right. me get in the time machine. Come on back. Um, <laughs> some tips. It yeah. isn't you know, that is really interesting. It, it, the workplace dynamics have definitely changed um, yeah. as teams work more in a hybrid or remote fashion. Mm-hmm. And in some ways, some things have gotten easier. Some things have gotten harder, you know? Yeah. No, exactly. Yeah. It, it, it's it's not all great or all terrible the pros and yeah. cons, and you have to navigate it. It depends on the I, I vacillate is. back and forth between, you know, for, for a while, I was very, I had a lot of concern about working remotely. Um, yeah. Just about like, you know, what I've been used to and like kind of creative dynamics of a workplace where I'm used to working in a like open floor plan or studio environment where people have visibility of what everybody's working on. That creates this environment where I can be exposed to things that and it could help me ask questions or be involved. Mm-hmm. A lot of conversations happen spontaneously that you don't get from a deliberate meeting, that kind of thing. Right. So I'm That's very skeptical, like, how is this going to work when we're all remotely? Um, I would say the evidence exists now that mm-hmm. you can make fantastic games that way. And I would say that solely because we've had the most 90 rated games ever this year. Right. And those oh, games right. were built through the pandemic. Right. A lot yeah. of those teams had to work remotely and right. they did fantastic work. So it's right. definitely possible. The other thing I'm kind of noticing, though, is that some games didn't make it. I had a game that didn't make it through, you know, and yeah. some games, most games took a lot longer because it's it's harder to do things, yeah. you know, asynchronously or remotely. Right. And I think a lot of the challenge that we're seeing, disruption we're seeing this year, where there are a lot of these layoffs, is some of that is related to the time and the money component. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think the time and the money component, some of that is related to having to build things remotely. So does it yeah. work? I think, yeah, it's definitely possible. Do we have to kind of rethink like the the economics of it? Probably. There's probably a case yeah. study in there um, yeah. about how to manage teams effectively for creative output, but also for the business output. Mm-hmm. in a remote right. environment yeah. right you have to excel in both of those axes what about advice you give someone looking to get their you know first job now in this world well world? I, I i would say what a great time to be considering working in the game industry because there are mm-hmm. so many ways to get exposure to the tools the to be able to create um on your own or in a yeah. small group you know, even before you get into the job market. But mm-hmm. what I always used to tell people, and I, I, I double down on this advice today, but I always used to tell people, like, like have a portfolio. 
build. Yep. You know, if, if you're an artist, if you're an engineer, if you do sound design, create, you know, and that is your that is the best way to start a conversation with a potential employer because a potential mm-hmm. employer wants to know what are you capable of yeah. and um, what better way to show your capability than to, to show something that you made. Uh, yeah. And then also to be able to talk about it, you know, like the decisions that you made mm. and, and to be able to describe the effort that you put into it. You know, a, a lot of what I think employers look for is talent is absolutely a component of it. But, right. um, you know, work ethic and, uh, you know, ha- how you work in a group and all those things are super important. And the best way to be, be able to judge those kinds of things is by talking and looking at actual examples. So I still mm. give that advice. And I think yeah. it's, it's more possible now than ever. For a student, yeah. or even if you're in high school or whatever, to be able to get, get a download UFN, <laughs> right. start right. making, you know, start start making and and try to be creative and try, you mm-hmm. know, yeah, you you can you can follow the mold of somebody that came before you that you like, or you can just try to be completely original. Either of those are great uh, directions to go if you're building something before you get into the uh, the job market. Yeah, yeah, and I universally hear that. And, and I tell that to people too, right? Like a resume is not enough. And I look at thousands of resumes a month, you, you know, and it's like, you want to see the link to the portfolio. You want to see what they've done. And, yeah. and to your point too, to be able to talk about like, yeah, this was really easy, but this part was really hard. And I had to do X, Y, and Z to show that persistence, you know, to be able to create that yeah. thing. And, I think and that part is key important. too. It's like being able to talk about what you did, how you did it, why you mm-hmm. did it, what was hard about what you did. And what was interesting, you know, I think that's, yeah. that is as important. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, for yeah, sure. totally. And then, um, you know, thinking about advice uh, for someone trying to advance their career currently working now as, you know, an engineer or game designer, if you want to have any thoughts around those, someone maybe mid-career trying to move forward. Yeah, you know, it, I think in some ways it, uh, it, it's helpful to ha- think about where you want to go long term. Mm-hmm. And I, I'll, I'll tell you. For myself personally, I've always kind of vacillated back and forth between, you know, my entrepreneurial, you know, aspirations and my creative aspirations. And often they mm-hmm. align, sometimes they don't. I find they align more easily when I'm building a company and a game or games at the same time. Working within a corporate environment, there's definitely opportunities to exercise those those entrepreneurial aspirations, but sometimes they don't mesh as well with the, sort of the creative aspiration. So having a, a good sense of what you want personally out of your career, I think is helpful to give yourself some goals, the kinds of things you want to work on. Always thinking about like, if you're at a large company, thinking about two things, like what you want to do next and what the company wants to do next, because sometimes they don't necessarily align. Mm. Um and right. you know if you if you want to be at a company sometimes it's good to try different things so if uh, you know if the company's direction doesn't necessarily align with where you want to go personally give yourself permission to try new things to maybe join a team that you might not consider joining that kind of thing yeah you know and like i said it's, the industry is fascinating because there's always there's always a new opportunity. Like, you know, mm-hmm. blockchain was a, opened up a lot of new opportunities a couple of years ago. Some of those are challenged yeah. today, but, right. you know, now, now you, there's a lot of opportunities in AI, and we're starting mm-hmm. to see a lot of opportunities in UGC. Mm-hmm. So have an open mind about where you want to take your craft as well, um, mm-hmm. because there's always something happening uh, in our yeah. business. Yeah, and kind of think about that that North Star, right? And, you know, where do you want to be? Where, where do you want to head? And you want to, you want to focus more on this type of game design or this other type and um, just kind of map from there and, and um, keep that in the back of your mind all the time. What do you feel is one of the most important qualities or skills to have working in game development? Well, you know, video game development is is very collaborative. You know, mm-hmm. it's a lot of it. You know, the, the, the business is creative. There's technology, but it's the output of a group of people. Right. Um, I always am attracted to working with folks who make those around them better and i don't know what you call that there's a there's a quality for that's a name for that quality right maybe it's leadership or maybe it's you know being a great communicator or it's being a great teacher and coach but those are all soft skills you know those are yeah. so so yes it's great to be a master of a craft and sometimes you need master crafts you always need master crafts people to create right. fantastic yeah. product mm. but what i find 
to be the the kinds of folks who I who I love to work with that I seek out mm-hmm. are those that are exceptional at their craft, but also have that other quality, that ability to work well within a team and to make a team better mm-hmm. than the team would be without them. You know, right? And that's uh, you don't find you don't find that uh, as often. <laughs> yeah, sometimes right. sometimes those two things exist on their own or often you will you know you will find and, and it's not necessarily experience based either there are a lot of younger yeah. folks who are just getting into the industry who are just so good at you know helping other people out and don't look at their career as a myopically as it's me you know it's right. it's about the team and you know there there's a phrase, a man, I don't know if it's a management phrase, but, it, you know, it's like the project, in some ways, it's a view of the project is not the game, the project's the team, you know, and the team makes the game. So mm-hmm. folks who are able to have that POV, I think, uh, is, a, yeah. is a really sought after, really important skill. Yeah, because sometimes you get those craftspersons or whatever, they're very good at something, but they're just horrible communicators and they're horrible and they, they bring people down, you know, and they see stuff as zero sum and, you know, it's just... It's not worth it, right? Like you want people who are good at so craft, sometimes that and, can be a challenge yeah. sometimes, yeah. yeah. And and you know, there's sometimes there are folks who are just really good at doing a thing, and that's fantastic. But right. if you're talking about like you know the where superstars or mm-hmm. it's like you know the kinds of folks that you want to work with over and over and over again, it's the yeah. rare combination of the two of just being really good at, at what they do and elevating those around them yeah. at the same time. Yeah, and kind of riffing off that, like. You know, what's your advice about developing interpersonal skills, EQ, core skills, as they call it, you know, the yeah. soft skills, get core feedback, skills. get, get feedback. feedback. Sometimes yeah. you don't know if uh, mm. some, sometimes you, it's hard to know if how you come across to others yeah. until they tell you. <laughs> right, right, right. We all have blind spots, right? Like, so, yeah, you're like, what do you mean? Exactly. Like, you, uh, like, you know, what? if you're if you're. You know, if you're working at a larger company, you can get that feedback as part of an HR process. And right. people are afraid of doing that kind of thing because, you know, sometimes you want to just be under the radar. But yeah. honestly, if you want to get good, you just ha- you have to practice. You know, you have to mm-hmm. put yourself in situations where you are working in that group. You are speaking up. You are trying to help people. And you are asking for that feedback. That's the only way to, it's, you know, it's like anything that we do in in, in yeah. this industry. It's iterative, right? You do something, you get yeah. the the result, and you incorporate that into the redo, you know, and mm-hmm. it's the same. You know, it's the same. Right. When I got started in this, in this industry, I, I wouldn't say I had a temper, but I didn't have patience, you know. Mm-hmm. And uh, that o- over time, you know, I don't know, but maybe I had kids. I could just, I just had no choice but to develop patience. <laughs> um, but uh, you know, when you have a little bit of patience, you become a better listener. And when you become a better listener, mm-hmm. uh, you take in more, and you're able to synthesize, and you're able to help people more. And that's a skill that I learned over time. It took me a long time. Yeah. To get better, I'm not going to say I'm good at it, but it took me a long time to get better at it, mm-hmm. um, and that's only through practicing. Yeah, right. And doing, you, you know, people can do the 360 reviews. You know, with, with peers, will will give you feedback as part of your performance reviews, and you can get feedback, you know, formally that way and informally. You know, I get better at it too. Like I, I was kind of known for being a bit of a hothead at times myself, and I think with time and comes wisdom, and then talking with people like when Justin Fish and I worked together, we kind of fed off each other because he was the calm one and I was a little more animated, you know, and um, some hey, of wait, wait, wait a second. That, Did you just call Justin Fisher the calm one? Yeah, which <laughs> <laughs> Justin Fisher, good friend, folks listening. Um, yeah. I'm not sure I'd characterize him as the calm person. Compared to whatever. me at times, okay. which is which is <laughs> kind of crazy then to say that now. Right. Oh, no, like, yeah. what the hell was I? No, because uh, Justin's yeah. awesome and, and we all work together at Wide Low Games. So, yeah. But yeah, with time comes that perspective and that maturity and sometimes you're like all right i've been yeah. through this before it, don't flip yeah. the gasket you know flip the table Here, here's the here's another thing you can try um yeah. you know often you'll be in a situation in a group or a project or work or whatever and you'll encounter somebody uh or have an interaction at the end of which you'll you'll say to yourself i don't like that person hmm. and if that happens ask yourself why and uh, yeah. Also, pay attention to how many times that happens. If that's mm-hmm. happening a lot, you may need to think about adjusting your worldview. Yeah. Um, and if it, and any times it happens, 
you should ask yourself why, because it might be an opportunity for you to understand what's going on with said coworker or or mm-hmm. other person that uh, leading to some behavior you find challenging. Right. Uh, and and if you can actually have a conversation about that, it's an opportunity to grow your your EQ mm-hmm. and your soft skills. Yeah. No, that makes sense. Yeah, and just trying to figure out why they're agitating you or why they're triggering you and reflect on that. Like, well, what is that? Is this someone in my past that they remind me of? So, so like, I'm <laughs> I'm laying that baggage on them because they remind I mean, me of X. I, I, I guess my know? point is some, sometimes it's all them, but not yeah, always. Yeah. No, right. It's usually, a, it's usually a hybrid, right? Yeah. Yeah. Right. It could be 90-10 or 70-30, right? But it's, yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah. Take it as really an opportunity a, to learn something. That's fair. So thinking over your career, like what's been one or two of your favorite games or projects to work on? I know you got a lot to, to pick from, so <laughs> uh, that's a tough one. Well, you know, I love all the, all the games that I've been involved in. I, I love them all. I'll mm-hmm. tell you, I've, I get very excited about doing new things or, you know, learning and that kind of thing. And so, yeah. you know, the very early uh, Bungie days were very exciting because, you know, we, we were just, you know, ev- everything that we did was a learning experience mm-hmm. and it, it was, it was a different time. You know, there was no internet yeah. right. um, and, you know, it was physical product. So mm-hmm. when we were making marathon and there was just so many problems to to solve, not just on the game side, but also like, how do you get distribution? How do you actually right. Right. print a box? You know, right. it's like all this stuff, you know, so. Right. Publishers so, and end caps and all exactly that, that period yeah. of time. It, it had a lot of challenges, but everything was a, a learning experience uh, mm-hmm. and it was a lot of fun. And similarly, you know, when we did Midnight Star on mobile, it was similar that there was we learned uh, a lot uh, about how uh, people play games on their phone mm-hmm. right. um, and how distribution on, you know, digital distribution it to a really big audience works. And I would say similarly right now, like I'm ha- having some of the most fun I've ever had making games right now because the the rate of learning is so fast. Uh, building in the UGC space. I mean, we've been going for six months. We've we just released our third game. Uh, wow. We're learning major things every time we release about how what players respond to, mm-hmm. um, how to make uh, games on this platform, how to build an audience, where the players are, all right. those kinds of things. So I would say th- those are just three examples of periods of time in my career where I've just had such a it's just so active and so many inputs going that it's just been very exciting. And that's, that mm-hmm. really gives me a lot of energy. Uh, yeah. You know, we got a lot of right. shit going on and in the start, <laughs> you know, that it's always like that. Yep. And I love that. Just love that. Right. And now there's tools too, that you can get the data back. So you're not like speculating on, you know, where, yeah, where the game trails it's not, it's off not just or trial and error, you know, it's yeah. like, right. You get a little bit of, quantitative feedback along the way you know it's mm-hmm. not just your finger in the wind uh, right or some know. random focus tests with 12 people and you're like they're yeah, all exactly. idiots uh, yeah, i can't yeah. listen to them yeah it's like um, yeah you'd be play testing your game before it comes out and you'd be like i think this game might be too hard no it's not too hard i can get through it in like 30 minutes i don't know it's like <laughs> and then you release and it's like oh that's way too hard too hard and yep. you can figure that stuff out now yeah yeah which is <laughs> Which is nice. Uh, so what are you really curious about right now in the game industry? I mean, you kind of have gone into the engine, you know, stuff like that. Is that kind of the main thing you're curious about or or what else? You know, we've talked about a lot of stuff you're curious about. Anything else that jumps out? Uh, so do you mean curious just like in like uh, well, a yeah, um, building? Like what are we yeah. exploring or just in general, like big picture game yeah, industry? Yeah, kind of like what are you curious about right now in the game industry, I guess, would you say? Just the industry as a large in, in, well, in well, I mean like yeah. well, what's gonna happen <laughs> yeah <laughs> well I mean I, I think we're in a we're in an interesting period of time right now there's been, it's like, been like a lot of consolidation like yeah <clears throat> with Microsoft buying Activision mm-hmm. you know there's there aren't a lot of independent you know large publishers anymore you know what's right. gonna happen on the other side of that uh are we, are we gonna see another new crop of independent development Mm-hmm. come up is it will it happen on platforms like uefn you know that's part of my thesis you know yeah. 
Yeah. We'll see. I mean, that, that's something I'm definitely curious about. Um, yeah. You know, that yeah. the, the future that we've been promised by science fiction is this kind of like <laughs> interoperable platform of content, not to just, yeah. you know, but plug what I'm doing, but it kind of looks like Fortnite, you know, is that, yeah. is that what it is? Um, yeah. Or, you know, is GTA 6 going to do the same thing? Who knows? Mm. You know, it's like, Right. It is it is interesting. There's there's there are games now that have been out for seven or eight years that are growing. <laughs> right. Yeah, which is wild. How right? many yeah. of those can we have? You know, it's like yeah. you know, and, and is that it's it's different from other forms of entertainment. It's, it sort of reads more like hobbies, you know. It's like right. You know, when you're growing up and you go to school, there's like seven sports you can choose from, maybe, mm-hmm. you know. Yeah. Will the video game business start to go that way? I, yeah. Probably yeah. not. I don't know. But like, yeah. Yeah. yeah There's just a lot of that's and honestly, that's I love that. I love that we don't know that there's this mix of creativity and technology and mm-hmm. things will be invented, things will be created that will change right. people's expectations of what playing a game can be and mm-hmm. who is um interested in being entertained that way um yeah yeah, yeah. It's, it's exciting it's times. Say, like i can't imagine trying to predict the game industry five or ten years from now yeah you know we we all try to but like if you just look backwards uh mm-hmm. it's you know every 10 years it's just very very different yeah yeah there's always like, these big cycles with with different things evolving um what about concerns or threats is, is there anything that you know Kind of like, whoa, this scares me, or I'm I'm worried about this in the industry. Uh, let's see. I do have some concern over just how, I, and I never had this concern until probably a year ago, hmm. of like what is going to happen to the workforce in our game industry as things continue to consolidate, and um, you know that the large companies uh, try to manage risk and how they're developing. Will there be fewer roles at higher pay? And will we have job erosion and and income erosion? Like, mm-hmm. there's a reason why many other industries have embraced unionization, and I I don't know enough whether to advocate for it in our our industry or not. But yeah. I can tell you that there have been more folks concerned about their employment future this year than I've seen in a long time, and I find mm-hmm. that concerning uh, because there's a yeah. lot of talent and there's clearly a lot of. Uh, appetite and dollars going into the industry. It's a two hundred billion dollar industry, and it continues to grow. Right. Um, so it's as concerning to me that there's so much churn happening mm-hmm. amongst uh, folks that build games. Yeah, um, and uh, I, I think that's something that um, I'm hoping is going to stabilize in the in the next year. Uh, mm-hmm. But if it doesn't, that's something that I have some concern over. I you yeah. know I I don't know what's going to happen with. AI either. I, I just have concerns about AI in general. Mm-hmm. My concerns are mostly about economic destabilization more so than, you know, Skynet. But, uh, you know, we're quick to rationalize our use of AI today as like a reference tool or just a tool. Mm-hmm. Uh, tomorrow, I don't know if that'll be the same. Five years from now, I don't know if that'll be the same. And that's just going to put more pressure on employment in general right and uh so i mean that's another area of concern that those are yeah. maybe macro things also yeah. you know not that i have all these concerns and and no optimism i have a ton of optimism but our mm-hmm. industry still still fails to be as diverse as uh the players Pop- general population yeah play. the players said yeah yeah, that's, yeah. Um, yeah and that just seems to be uh so slow to change and and mm-hmm. um it's unfortunate but uh yeah that's something that I, I do have optimism that as uh, more people get into the go to school for games and get into the workforce, that there'll be more and mm-hmm. more opportunities for a, a diverse workforce to reflect more of the consumers of games um, mm-hmm. like. But uh, yeah, society in general. And stuff. Yeah. 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 What are your thoughts on AR and VR and XR, stuff like that? I got really excited about VR many years ago. I decided at some point that the form factor of a VR headset um, would keep that technology in the novelty space yeah. um, and, until there was some form factor breakthrough. I think that's right. largely been correct, I think, at least from my POV, except that there continues to be a lot of investment in the, the software and the hardware 
mm-hmm. primarily driven by Meta, um, which has produced some outstanding uh, experiences and content. So from mm-hmm. that perspective, it's cool. It's super cool. And yeah. I got friends working on VR projects, and when they show me stuff they're working on on the the Quest Three, I'm like, I'm blown oh, right. away. like this is one. science right. fiction. This is right. super cool. I'm still hopeful that we will get technology that I can use in my daily life. I don't feel like I can use VR in my daily life. I feel mm-hmm. like it's a a thing that I need to plan for so that I can charge a device and that I can black out my world for a little bit to try right. a thing. I definitely can imagine a point where I am able to interact with the world with a digital overlay right. and that's accessible, mm-hmm. but uh, I'm not sure when that's going to happen. And honestly, right. who knows, we may skip the final evolution of that hardware in lieu of an interface. Like if we had an interface that you didn't actually have to look through a pair of glasses, it just, you know, mm. connected to your Retinous whatever. <laughs> yeah. That's yeah. also very terrifying. Like, so yeah. I have an electric car that's all connected to the internet, and I am terrified that some enterprising hacker will be able to control my car. Right. Yeah. And I don't know why they'd want to control my car, but if they controlled the whole <laughs> fleet of cars, that could be pretty devastating. Right. And uh, I mean, the so you idea can't turn that, it on. Yeah. You yeah. Know, you brick it. Well, brick I your mean, car, right? You know, yeah. Right. Yeah. Heck, I'd hate for them to turn left while I'm on the highway. But yeah. um, just imagine if you know if we were all plugged into the inter- internet with a, some brain interface, like. Mm-hmm. That gives the word virus a whole new <laughs> yeah. meaning. Yeah. I don't yeah, know yeah. that I would sign up for version one of that. No, no, yeah. Get to, get the kinks worked out before you get involved with that. But that's another but yeah, thing yeah. like with, with mm-hmm. AI that like access to technology. At some point that technology like you know, we see it with the iPhone, right? It's like yeah, and in some ways that's become democratizing because people couldn't afford a computer but you can afford a phone and so the world has phones right billions of it, smartphones it's probably an unfair yeah. statement because there's probably plenty of people that don't but there's billions and billions of smartphones out there yeah. and so now a lot of people are connected to the internet mm-hmm. but if we if we start consuming technology based on ai and based on sort of like neural connectivity that is science fiction now but oh right and right. and that is not available to everyone then we've really created an additional class of person that we right need. us and them and yeah all that kind of stuff yeah yeah, yeah I, i'm hopeful on ai like i i see it as being useful and powerful and you know it can always go sideways or whatever but um I, I tend to be more bullish on AI and see where it goes. And, you know, VR too, right? Like it used to be with the Vive and you had to be tethered to a laptop and you had cables and cameras and it was just such a clunky yeah. process. And now, yeah. you, you know, it's still, you're still putting a strap in a brick to your head, but with the Meta, at least it's, you know, you're not tethered. And, oh uh, yeah, no, the, the, like the, the Quest 3 is a very impressive piece of hardware. It's yeah. great, but it's yeah. not a thing that I'd wear down the street, you know? Right. And is, it, is that the Vision Pro, right? Like, or, you know, where's that going? Because Apple's never the first, but they always seem to figure it out when they do come into the market. So it'd be exciting to see in 24 where that goes. What's a funnier, odd story from working in the industry that you would like to share? Because I'm sure you get a ton of those, too. <laughs> mm, <laughs> like, funny or what? odd story. Um, this, this is a weird story. And it's, it's not, I don't want it to come across as like all egotistical or whatever, but a couple of years ago, my washing machine broke, okay. and I got online to find a replacement washing machine, and I found one. Mm-hmm. And I called this appliance store. I guess they like may kind of like they. It was a phone number, you know. Yeah, whatever. I called this place. Right. And I'm ordering a washing machine, and you know, I'm giving them my name and stuff. And the person knew was into <laughs> games. Right and new, like, we just started talking about like marathon and Halo oh, and wow. stuff, and I had this yeah. like twenty minute long conversation with <laughs> the guy who sold me a washing machine, <laughs> and I wasn't yeah. expecting that. Right, right. That You're doesn't like, happen. Uh, it's a never. That doesn't happen for, to me. <laughs> uh, but it was. It was pretty cool. Yeah. I guess. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. Who would have thought the Maytag man was a gamer? Right. Like you just call up and. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, wow. Well, I mean, we, Alex Seropian, would you I've, happen to I've be? Gotten, yeah. I've gotten old enough now that like I'm older than most people. <laughs> yeah. And so most people have grown up with video games, I guess. So it's uh, right. Yeah. You when I was both. young, you know, it's like most people didn't grow up with video games. So they wanted to ban them because they were violent, you know. Right. And now it's like yep. the other way around. Yeah. Or you just went to the arcades or you did your basement and, you know, it wasn't so ubiquitous as it is now, right? It's just 
that's everywhere. And speaking of games, like, is there a game you're playing right now that you're excited about? Is there, or, or games, plural? Like, is there anything that you're currently playing? I'm heading to Chicago and I'm taking my Steam Deck with me. Mm. And I'm actually got myself very excited to play Doom 2016. And I know that's going to sound weird because that game came mm. out a long time ago, but I never <laughs> played it when it came right. out. And right. uh, so that's what I'm excited to tuck into over Christmas break. Yeah, yeah, and you can take it with you. You can do it on the plane. You can you can do it at the house. Uh, I've never picked one of those up. Are you pretty happy with it? The, the Steam Deck. I love it. I, I hear oh, it's, it's cool. great. It's really yeah. good. It's really good. Yeah, you can play your whole library on there, right? Basically, so I mean, that's that's pretty awesome. Um, yeah, I play. I uh, I think the first. What would I? Uh, I think I was. I played Hades on it too. It's really good. Mm, people talk about that one a lot too. Played the original Half Life on it. It actually runs. Huh. <laughs> that's funny. <laughs> Gabe's like, we got to make sure Half-Life runs on that thing. Um, so where can people find you online? Like website, socials, stuff like that. Where, where's a good place? Oh, yeah. You know? Cool. All right. Well, if you want to listen to the podcast, it's at thefourthcurtain.com. Mm-hmm. And speaking of Steam Decks, we're actually giving away a Steam Deck. So come on over to the website. And cool. um, I think uh, there's a few ways to get into that. You can back our Kickstarter, which is on there. Or you could just tweet at us or join our Discord, whatever. That's the fourth curtain.com. And then the studio is looknorth.world. That's the URL, www.looknorth.world. You'll find mm-hmm. island codes for our games up there. You can hit me up on LinkedIn. I'm just Alex Ropian on LinkedIn. So on Twitter as Steak Bacon. And um, <laughs> that's right. Yeah. If anybody's yeah. interested in what we got going on at the studio, Mm-hmm. We um, did just finish a game jam. We'll probably be doing another game jam uh, in a in a few, cool. probably in a few months. Mm-hmm. And we do sometimes open up some spots to join us uh, there. So just following us on Twitter is a good way to yeah. hear about things like that. How big is the studio now? Is it like 10, 20, 30, 50 people? We yeah, have so. six full-time employees and okay. uh, we do work with a couple of uh, co-dev partners. Mm-hmm. And we have uh, a few contract employees as well. Okay. Uh, but it's a pretty small, tight team right now. Yeah. And Patrick's with you also, right? Patrick Moran? Patrick Moran is with us. Yeah, cool. I had him on an episode three, four years ago. Yeah. It was, uh, <laughs> it was like, can I get Patrick? The team is really, is really fantastic. Mm-hmm. I've known all these folks for over 10 years. And they all have that quality I'm talking about. Right. Like they all make, we all make each other better in some way. Me probably less so than everybody else, but it's just a a great crew. And I, I definitely advise finding people that you can trust and holding on to them. Mm -hmm. People can learn skills, you know, but being responsible, trustworthy, reliable, easy to work with, great communicator, you know, great EQ, all of those things. Those are, those are what really matter in sort of building a long-term relationship where you, where you can work together on a team. Yeah. No, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. There's people I've worked with at two or three different companies. It's always been very good to work with them. And you just want to kind of stay around those people. Last question. What's one piece of advice you give others working in the industry right now? Hang on. <laughs> <laughs> Buckle up. Hang, hang on. I, uh, honestly, you know, I'm always optimistic about where this industry is going. And I, I don't think that's naivete. I think that's just a, a realization that entertainment is so important to the human condition. And technology mm-hmm. is always evolving. And when you put those two things together, you've got the game industry. It's a very unique place. It's a very unique craft skill and product that we make. And we fill an ever-increasing part in people's lives. So if you have trepidation, concern, fear about what's happening uh, this year, it's always a brighter tomorrow. It certainly is. Um, yeah. So yeah. it's, uh, yeah. it's and, my, and then, my one bit of parting wisdom. <laughs> right. No, that's that, that's fair. And, and I think, too, there's there was an ex- expansion and now a contraction, right? Like a couple of years ago it felt like a feeding frenzy and, and everyone was hiring and people were job hopping, getting 20, 30% bumps, you know? So companies just kind of went on a, a hiring spree and they, they overhired, right? There, there, now there's a little bit of course correction coming in and they're like, whoa, you know, burn rates and everything. We kind of tip the scales a little bit too far that way. So hopefully through 23, we've, we've played catch up and, and it's not going to be like another year of, I don't know, 65 or 7,000 layoffs, like what we did in 23 here. And now it's going to start kind of coming back the other way and it stabilizes a little bit more. And it's just the ebb and flow, you know, it's, it's never static. It's never 
predictable all the time, but, but hopefully we're over that hump uh, with new stuff and then less layoffs and things. Well, thank you so much uh, for being on the show. And um, yeah, I cannot recommend enough. Everyone check out The Fourth Curtain and listen to Alex's uh, podcast. And, and who's your co-host? It was uh, Art Aaron Mariquin. Uh, Aaron, okay. uh, also an alumni of, of Wide Load. We've known each other for, for many, many years. Hmm. Uh, worked on Stubbs and as part of Industrial Toys and now Look okay. World as well. Whoa, that was abrupt. Uh, the podcast version goes an extra 10 seconds longer with the normal ending. Hope you enjoyed this new format with video for those of you watching on YouTube. And just another quick reminder, you can help support the show at Game Dev Advice Patreon. And if interested in one-on-one -on -one monthly coaching, check out the Gain Wisdom membership. Take care.